Okay, so uh, my name is Gareth. You're watching the Hub Online Network. Welcome uh, Jackie Taggart to the show again. Uh, uh, so tell us about how you've been over the last, is what, how, how long has it been? A couple months since we've spoken? Yeah, it's been a couple of months and what an interesting couple of months it's been. Um, the house was sitting in Victoria. We uh, prepared to leave for a two-week break and we haven't been back since. Wow. And I think that um, that experience is not unusual for so many people during this COVID crisis. Um, the biggest event when we left the house was the protests around uh, the railways and, and the Wet'suwet'en. And uh, we came home and COVID-19 started. And it's been quite a journey ever since then. Has, so going back to the, uh, the, the pipeline, has there been any resolutions from that? Or did COVID just kind of squash everything? And I think COVID took over and has, has been the priority both of government and of British Columbians. Uh, trying to keep people safe and healthy and uh, listening to Dr. Bonnie Henry give us the direction we need to um, be where we are today. Um, so have you been, has there been any involvement from you in uh, how the government's been running? Well, we uh, made a decision right from day one that um, this was a health issue and this was a critically important health issue. And so as a party, as an opposition party, um, we, we joined with uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry and Minister Dix to um, look at how do we best deliver the message, how do we ensure that people are safe, and how do we support the actions taken by the public health officer. And so you'll see that um, our, our health critic, Norm Letnick, has been uh, co-hosting meetings uh, with Interior Health, town halls, uh, those kinds of things, because we were very adamant right from day one that this was not an issue that you that you politicize. So we've been very supportive of the work of Dr. Henry, um, trying to get the message out on what her direction is. And I think that British Columbians have a lot to be proud of when you look at where we are today. Um, how do you, is there anything that you can say about how we've been doing things opposed to like Ontario or Quebec? Is there any major differences that you've seen? Well, one of the things that we were very fortunate in British Columbia with, and it was just by luck that our uh, spring break was later than Quebec's right. and um, I do believe than Ontario's. And when you look at the outbreak in both of those provinces, it is reflective of the fact that spring break was earlier, people had traveled, they'd gone to Europe, they'd gone to New York City, and uh, they came home, many of them, with COVID. And so we were very fortunate that um, our spring break came later, and Dr. Uh, Henry's direction was to not travel. And so I think that that put us in a good starting point when we look at our COVID uh, strategy around how to flatten the curve. Um, so th uh, the, the, the health things aside, uh, some of the things that the NDP government has been uh, doing in tandem with COVID is things like um, giving people $1,000, uh, a one-time $1,000 stimulus, um, making sure that the, and I'm, this might be more federal, but you know, keeping the border shut down. Um, what does the, what do the Liberals have to say about stuff like that? Well, I think all of us recognize what a challenge it's been for people who, um, whose businesses are closed and whose employees are laid off. And so we're very supportive of uh, programs that help keep people employed, uh, that help keep people um, feeding their families and paying their rents. So, you know, as much as you're very concerned about the health issues, we're also very concerned about the impact on families and on uh, people's income. So as we look to recovery, we need to keep in mind that we have um, thousands of people in British Columbia who are unemployed, don't know how they're going to pay their rent on June 1st, and are struggling. And um, I think that we only have to look around our community and look at um, how many small businesses have been closed 
and how many people they employ to know that it's a challenge. And, and the federal government in particular has stepped up um, and British Columbia has enhanced some of those programs from the federal government. How do you feel that Ashcroft um, and Cash Creek specifically have been doing in the light of this pandemic? Well, I think that um, all of us have been challenged um, by the directives to stay home and to uh, ensure that we don't spread um, or have a, uh, a large group of people that we interact with. It's, um, I think that the riding as a whole has been quite successful. We look at the numbers in interior health and um, we've, we've done very well. Um, of course, we had a, um, a situation in Cache Creek, which was handled quickly. And I think that people will say that um, there's good direction from public health and good support through interior health. So as much as many people in our communities think it's not here, um, I would encourage people to remember that Dr. Bonnie Henry says, um, act like you have COVID. Right. Uh, think about that as you expand your uh, contacts and you expand your bubble of people. Uh, think about the fact that you're inviting everyone that they have invited into their lives um, into yours. So as much as we're anxious to get the economy back on track, um, we need to be cautious also that we don't uh, reinvigorate COVID-19. Um, so that being said, so, so since all of this has been going on, there's been lots <coughs> of uh, debates about certain things. So where do you fall on the wear a mask, don't wear a mask? Uh, I think it's, um, public health has been pretty clear that <clears throat> excuse me, you wear a mask uh, to protect others. And um, so they, they have said it is your personal choice. Some places have um, said as part of their safety plans to come into their place of business, they expect you to wear a mask. So I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, um, take a look at what the information is from the public health officer and make a personal choice. And don't make judgment on other people. Uh, it is a personal choice. Some people can't wear masks. And so, and so we really need to be aware that, um, that Dr. Bonnie Henry has said that if you're more comfortable wearing a mask, then do so. But if you keep your social distancing, you wash your hands, uh, you do the steps that she's indicated, that you should uh, that should suffice also. So personally, I've worn a mask, but um, it's really people's personal choice at this point. Uh, the other day on your Twitter, I saw you with a hashtag share hope not hate, I believe it was. Yes. Um, can you explain or, 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 or tell us a little bit more about that? Well, we've seen such an increase in uh, racial tension and in uh, racial incidents, particularly at the coast and particularly uh, targeted at Asian people in regards to COVID. And I think it's critically important that uh, we, we be very public about that not being acceptable behavior. Um, we are Canadians, we are British Columbians. Um, British Columbia is made up of many, many different, different ethnic groups. And um, I'm, I'm saddened by some of the actions that I've seen on TV and some of the incidences that have been reported that we see elderly people being attacked on the street. Uh, we see um, people um, graffiti incidents in the, at the coast. And that's not, that's not my Canada. So the, um, the Twitter um, process was to bring awareness and to remind people that um, there are neighbors, there are friends, there are fellow Canadians. And uh, racism any place is, has no place in Canada. Um, so just as an aside to that, talking about racism and that kind of thing, have you been following what's been going on with this George Floyd situation in the States? 
I, I've seen a little bit of it. Um, uh, it's absolutely devastating. And um, I think that we're in the midst of COVID. Um, I think all of us are feeling a little out of sorts. Um, there's tension, there's um, less interaction, less understanding of each other, more influence, I think, by um, media and social media. And I think what we're seeing in the States is, is absolutely um, appalling in regards to um, civil unrest and the racism down there. Um, so let's talk about schools. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're talking about reopening uh, schools up starting, I believe, Monday. Uh, we're, we're talking about that. Can you do, tell us about what your thoughts are on, are we opening schools up too soon? Are we, are we in BC just at the right time to start doing stuff like this? Well, the question I'm hearing from uh, constituents is what is school going to look like, right? So um, it, it is important that parents feel that their children are safe in the schools. And I know that the school systems are working very hard to ensure that. But kids are kids. And so um, how do we ensure social distancing? How do we ensure the hand washing, the cough in your elbow, all those kinds of things? Um, I know that school staffs have been working on this for quite some time. And I'm encouraged that the government has said it is optional. Uh, because I know for some parents, um, they're very, very um, concerned about sending their kids to school and ensuring that the proper um, processes are in place and that their kids will follow those. So it's, it's um, one month. It is part-time. Um, it's parents' choice. Um, but I've been, I've been impressed with um, the flexibility in the system and the, um, also the choice that parents have to do distance learning if, if that's their choice. So it's, um, I think education has become a priority for lots of families, uh, perhaps in a new way. And um, we, we're seeing all kinds of opportunities to think about um, what education looks like for our own kids. On a MLA level, are you working at all with the School District 74 or any others in your riding about what they're doing? No, I haven't. Um, I haven't become involved in that. I'm certainly working on economic recovery with some of our communities. Um, but the school system um, seems to be on track. We don't hear a lot from constituents. So um, I'm, I'm going to trust that things are being done well and that if people have concerns, they'll approach us. So what uh, things, have, have your committees that you're a part of been meeting virtually then? Yes. And what, 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 what kinds of things have you been uh, discussing in those groups? Well, it's, it's about finding the balance. Um, we have done a very, very good job of staying at home, uh, distancing ourselves, working from home. Um, and now, as we open up, uh, we need to, um, to show people that it is okay to come outside, to come, to come into a business, that businesses have the appropriate safety plans um, as per the direction of the public health officer to ensure that uh, there is a low risk for you to go into their business. Now, the other side of that is because we've done such a good job of encouraging people to stay home, many are hesitant to come out. And um, many are hesitant um, and think that government or communities are moving too fast to open up. But the other side of the coin is um, we have many unemployed people who are looking to go back to work. And many small businesses who have overhead costs that continue whether people come through their front door or not. And, and so it's a fine balancing act. And um, we're working hard to, um, to find that sweet spot in the balancing act. I've heard from uh, people across the riding who say, um, we don't want visitors because we're safe here. We don't have COVID here. 
And my question is, um, Dr. Bonnie Henry says, assume COVID is everywhere. And um, there is no one community that is safe from everything. And so how do we make sure that processes are in place to ensure that we're at the lowest risk we possibly can be at as we slowly open the economy? And that's mostly what I'm hearing about. Um, and, and what I hear also is as communities open up, um, people are fearful and we have to we have to hear their voices and we have to ensure that we address uh, their concerns. So um, we're working uh, on a daily basis to do that. Um, so once, so here we are, we're, we're, we're just either going into phase two or we just started phase two of our uh, reopening and economic development and that sort of uh, stuff. Um, what do you see happening uh, moving forward? So, for example, um, I've heard the, the terms uh, depression, recession uh, thrown around quite a bit. Um, so what are you seeing on an MLA level? As Are we moving in that direction or are we looking like we're going to come at this on, in, a, in a positive uh, note? I'm always an optimist. I would uh, be the first one to say that Dr. Bonnie Henry um, and Minister Dix have done a great job around the health issue. As we go into phase two, we need to look at not just the health issue, we need to continue with that, but we need to look at the impact on our economy. And we need to look at, at what that means to each of our communities and our business sector. We've been pretty fortunate in so many areas of the riding that employers have been quite generous. They've sent people home in order to have the social distancing, but have continued to pay them. Uh, that is not the norm in every community. And so uh, we need to think about our friends and neighbors who are sitting at home, seeing the third month of rent uh, due or the third mortgage payment due, and no income coming in. Uh, they may have uh, gotten the $2,000 uh, through the federal government and the extra 1,000, but they're falling behind and they're wanting to go to work. And so how do we do the plan to move forward to uh, get the economy going again? But I can tell you as a region that uh, went through the fires, we've seen floods. And again, this year we saw floods. Um, we've seen small businesses that um, have yet to recover from 2017, and they're struggling. And um, I, I think one of the things that COVID has done is made all of us realize the importance of the services that we have in our own community. When you're asked not to drive out of your community except for essential services, um, it makes you realize how important things like hardware stores, things like drug stores, uh, local newspapers, um, how important those stores are to who we are as a community. And um, I certainly hope during the COVID that we all have had conversations around our dinner tables about how important it is that we support these small businesses. So I'm concerned, of course, about how many small businesses will be able to survive. We're hearing that if we go into a second um, round of COVID-19 in the fall, and the prediction is that it may be worse than it was in the spring, um, that, that that will devastate our small, um, our small businesses and it will devastate our economy. And I'm not sure what that looks like. I think all of us are working very hard to try and minimize the impact. But um, I have yet to see a comprehensive plan from government. And it is critically important that the rules be clear, that um, somebody knows what the rules are as they attempt to open their business. One of the things that we've done as opposition is sent a number of letters to the premier outlining what we think would help um, open up the economy. Things like 
um, a holiday from PST. Uh, things like the employer health tax being put off for 90 days. Things like, um, you know, the minimum wage increase. Um, uh, now is not the time. How do we minimize the, um, the cost, the governmental cost to small business in order to get small businesses up and running? And in order for those small businesses to um, get their employees back in their doors and at work. And that's what a recovery plan needs to look like. And each of the communities, um, you know, that have contacted me certainly are looking for um, strategies around that. But one of the things I hear constantly is it's not clear what the rules are. And that lack of clarity and that concern that I've done my safety plan, I've opened my store, but I'm not sure if someone comes in and says, you haven't thought about this and reports me, uh, what that'll mean to my small business. Because the rules are so fluid and it's hard to get a straight answer. And that uncertainty is very tough for our small businesses. Normally, when um, when laws are created and and things are put through in uh, the legislative assembly, how long does it take for a standard bill to be thought of, uh, put out there, um, changed as many times as it needed to be changed through the committees, and then put into law? Well, normally, it's it's uh, I would say a six to nine month process. Um, what we're seeing here is a state of emergency right. and the government uh, being given special um, special ability to deal with the state of emergency and also the public health officer having um, the power to make um, decisions based on her um, expertise around public health. So between the two, um, that's where sometimes where the um, lack of clarity comes is um, one day we hear drive-ins, commercial drive-ins are okay and pop-up drive-ins are only allowed 50 cars. The next day we hear, no, no, everybody, it's only 50 cars. Um, you know, like when I, you talk to businesses, their, their frustration is, I, I want to open. I want to follow the rules, but I can't get clarity on what the rules are. Right. So it's a, it's a tough one, and and it's something that government needs to address quickly. Um. So these uh, new rules are sort of being not cobbled together because they they are professionals that are uh, putting these rules into place. Yeah. Um, but do you see over the course of the summer uh, rules getting stricter or or more like as businesses open? Do you feel that there's going to be instances where they go, OK, this has now happened. We need to enforce stricter rules. Or do you think that we're going to move into more easings? As we move well, I think I think it very much depends on the numbers. Right. And I think it depends on how we do with the numbers um, of new cases. And um, we are coming up to the second week after the um, going into phase two, where we were um, able to increase our bubble um, and socialize a little bit more. And, and some of our businesses have begun to open. And so we'll be watching the numbers very closely as I'm sure Dr. Henry will. And um, I think that uh, depending on what happens there, um, it will, we will see a reaction to numbers that increase. Uh, so I was watching Premier John Horgan's statement on the 27th, so a couple, just, just a couple days ago. Um, he was saying that we've now, that they're extending the state of emergency for another two weeks. Yeah. And that this is now the longest period of state of emergency that BC has ever been in. Um, do you feel that we are going to be seeing this extended past the next two weeks? Well, I couldn't tell you for sure. Um, 
it it very much is the government's purview to decide that. Um, the state of emergency has been important up to today. And um, I would expect that um, two weeks hence, um, we will be in a different place. And it may be that the state of emergency can, um, can stop. So um, it, it really is a very fluid situation and it really does depend on numbers. Um, as we said, they've done a fairly good job about the health issues and about dealing with um, the public health based on science. But as we move to the next phase, um, the health issues are as under control, I think, as we can as as we can expect. Now we move into how do we open up. Uh, based on the directives from Dr. Bonnie Henry and based on the um, decisions made by government. And so as an opposition, those are the questions that we'll have for government as we go back into the session. And that being said, uh, again, back to uh, Premier John Horgan's uh, speech the other day, he was talking about uh, Legislative Assembly getting back to it. And I, I want to... June something, I forget the exact date that they're talking about. Um, June 22nd. Yes, thank you. Uh, it sounds like he's open to people being virtually attending and being there in person. Uh, are you planning on going back to the building? Or are you planning on uh, uh, doing it over your computer? I'm planning on going back to the building at least for part of it. Um, the thing is that um, I can drive there in my car by myself. I can stay in the car on the ferry and I have accommodation there. So um, I can be as safe there as I can be at home. Right. And that's really important to me. Um, we need to follow the guidelines of the public health officer. And so um, when I assess whether to um, do it via Zoom, um, or to be in the building. At this point, I plan on going down to Victoria. That's, um, you know, that's a personal decision. And um, they are offering a hybrid model where some will be at home because of concerns around travel, um, perhaps um, compromised immune systems, uh, family uh, issues, etc. And so they've um, provided a very flexible opportunity. Um, but I, I plan on going down. Uh, so, so some bigger topics that have been coming up over the last couple of months um, has been uh, broadband in rural areas. Uh, so so and the, 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 there's a couple more that we'll get to, but let's talk about broadband. Um, is, is that something that falls that the uh, provincial government has some kind of influence on? Is that something that absolutely. they're pushing for? Yes, absolutely. And, and I can tell you that we have been uh, um, advocating for internet access and broadband with for years. Um, I think it has been particularly uh, highlighted during this time of COVID as we all have uh, connected with family via uh, FaceTime and Zoom and all kinds of other platforms. Um, people have become very, um, very well versed in how to use technology uh, to uh, connect with others. And um, we've certainly seen some gaps in service. Uh, the other thing is, is it's not just for connecting uh, family to family, friend to friend. It's about doing your business. It's about educating your children. It's the new world. And so if, if nothing else has happened, um, COVID has just um, highlighted how important broadband is and how disadvantaged some of our communities are in regards to their access to broadband. Um, one, so th because this just popped in my head, one sad thing that yeah. has happened since COVID, and another sad thing, because it's, it's really been a litany of, uh, sort of weird things that just keep happening and happening and happening. Yeah. Um, but this was the uh, the snowboard crash. 
Yes. Um, and only, and I bring this up because I, I follow you on Twitter and yeah. I, I see that you were retweeting a bunch of stuff about it. So I just wanted to know if you had some kind of a, something you wanted to say in regards to that. Pretty devastating, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, were, were, were you able to, I, I don't know how much you've left um, your, your home. Were you able to, or did you watch the drum circles that were going on? Uh, at the, uh, not the crash site, but at the airport in Kamloops? Yes. Actually, Kamloops was, did an incredible job of um, the memorial. Uh, the, um, the, the gentleman that was flying the plane has now gone home to Moose Jaw, uh, but there was also a, another drum circle outside of the, the hospital that he was able to watch. Is, is Kamloops part of, no, Kamloops isn't part of your riding, is it? No, no, my riding goes to just outside of Kamloops, but Skeetis and Indian Band was part of the drum circle. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so it shows how, how important those ceremonies are. Right. Um, the Legion also held a memorial ceremony. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, um, in, in Kamloops at the airport. But the other thing was, was it's difficult uh, to have any kind of ceremony uh, during COVID. And as much as people wanted to gather or want to, you can't. Right. And that's one of the challenges. I keep having um, th th these interviews and I keep wanting to say, let's pretend that COVID's not a thing. You know, what would the ideal situation be like? And it's just really uh, interesting how you, you can't do that anymore. You, you can't yep. pretend that it's not there. Um, but. Well, I think the other thing, Gareth, is is that, um, you know, when it first started, um, many people talked about when we get back to normal. Right. Well, I think that uh, COVID has shown us that this is the new normal, that this isn't a one week or two week thing. We're now into month three. Um, we have all adjusted to staying at home and um trying very hard to be aware of who's in our bubble and who we uh, contact with so that if we, God forbid, ever had to trace back that we know who we've been around. Um, I think that people have grown to understand the importance of that. Um, we have an incredible uh, respect for our seniors who have been particularly vulnerable during this time, uh, those people on the front lines who are doing the work every day. Um, but you think about things like funerals, things like weddings, things like graduations that have um, a special historic kind of um, cultural feeling that all of us have an expectation of what that'll look like. And none of those things look like that anymore. And so um, as much as some days you can think, oh my goodness, is it ever gonna end? You need to look at some of the incredible things that have happened. Um, from before COVID to now, is, is there anything that could, in a positive way, like let's say this is the new normal and we don't want to go back to the old normal because the old normal, let's say, didn't work. Is there anything that we can change moving forward that will uh, that we can better society with because COVID happened? Well, you know, I, it's interesting because I, I do a lot of outreach and, and I was talking to someone who said, you know, um, as I look out my window, it reminds me of being a kid in the 60s. He said, um, brothers and sisters are playing with each other. He said, they're riding bikes and they're riding through the ditches and they're making trails and they're making um, forts out in the forest. And they're uh, coming home at five o'clock when their mom's calling them in for dinner. And their mom goes to town once a week to grocery shop. She doesn't go three times a day. And um, he said, it just reminds me of the 1960s. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, um, we've been in this situation uh, for a long enough period of time for many of us to rethink 
about what our normal was and all the things that were frenetic in our lives and um, how important were they when we think about how where we live is so important, our health is so important, and, um, and our family is so important. So um, I, I think that COVID has given us all the opportunity to take a look at what is our new normal? What is that going to mean to me? And um, is it going to be uh, slipping back into the old ways that had many people absolutely stressed to the max and um, feeling like they were on a treadmill that was going way too fast. COVID has given us the opportunity to slow down, to um, reconnect with those closest to us, and um, to have the conversation about, uh, as we slowly go back, what is our going back going to look like? So, so I, I don't know any other time in my history uh, that we've had that opportunity. This is history making. Uh, to be a part of this, to be um, to see how we're reacting to it, and um, I think British Columbians uh, have a lot to be proud of. Yes, there certainly are some uh, situations that we um, we've seen that we're not that proud of but i can tell you um as a british columbian i think we've we've done well so far and um we just need to move forward and get people back to work and um and remove the stress of unemployment and um and the loss and feeling like you're behind the eight ball uh, because uh, you've been at home now for three months well, this, this, that's a very good segue to the next topic, which is the possibility of universal basic income. Um, now, this might be more of a federal thing, but what are your thoughts on everybody getting a, uh, you know, I, I think it's the same amount as the CB, CERB every month moving forward. I think the, um, the thing, it, the, the situation is that um, when, whenever you put a program in place, you need to look at how you pay for it. Right. And um, I, I've heard hundreds of concerns uh, from people across the riding uh, talking about uh, how are we going to pay for uh, COVID, our COVID-19 um, uh, support systems that we put in place. And I would suggest to you that we, we as a country, um, would need to look very seriously whether what is affordable. And um, I would suspect that we are going to be looking at significant deficits, both federally and provincially. That uh, is money that comes out of the taxpayer's uh, pocket. And that is you and me. Yep. And that, uh, so when we look at programs and we look at uh, particularly universal programs, we need to look at the cost and we need to look at how do we generate the dollars in order to support that. And, and I would suggest to you that when we look at the deficit where we will be in um, as we move through COVID, um, we're going to have, have to have some very, very tough decisions. Um, another thing that has been that has been thrown around here recently is moving to a four-day work week policy. Um, do you see how that would be beneficial or not? Well, um, a four a four-day work week does that mean a four-day work week with a five-day pay? Or so I believe it would be four days at ten-hour shifts. Okay. Um, I, I think that um, some people think that that would increase people's ability to be out and about and to help the economy move forward. Um, I personally um, am reminded of my father-in-law who um, said to my husband at one point, 12 hour days, 
we went on strike to get an eight hour day so that we could be at home with our families. Right. So when we look at um, options out there on how we can stimulate the economy, we also need to look at the unintended consequences. So um, a four day work week might work for some, but I don't believe it would work for everyone. But I think we need to be flexible so that people can take a look at their individual situation and the employer and employees can do that together and um, make that decision together. I don't think that government should um, decree that there will be a four day work week. Because um, it doesn't work for everybody. Uh, what about the, um, no, what was it? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back. It'll, it'll come back to me. So, so we'll, we'll move on. Okay. Um, another big thing that has happened since last time we spoke was, of course, the shootings in Nova Scotia. Um, and I, I, I hate to do this to you, but um, so uh, that tragedy happened, and then the federal government put in the uh, the, the gun ban, uh, not ban, ban. Um, where do you where do you sit on on that? And how does that affect the province, or, or does it affect um, MLAs in that in that level of government? That's a federal government uh, decision, and um, the situation in Nova Scotia was absolutely devastating. Um, I think that um, you know, as we go through the COVID situation, we have expressed, and many people have expressed, um, concern about people's mental health, and. Um, not saying that uh, that that is the situation in Nova Scotia, but you know, there's only there's only so much people can take, and um, those sad situations are just devastating. And then again, to look at the impact of COVID on the ability to gather together, to celebrate lives, to be a community together. Um, I've been so impressed with how communities and uh, people have adapted and done what they need to do in order to honor and uh, remember. So, um, you know, like Nova Scotia was devastating, but I also think about uh, how many deaths we've had um, in British Columbia and across the country and how many families uh, couldn't be there with their loved ones, how many couldn't hold a celebration of life like they would like to, um, and how many have adapted in order to do what they need to do to, um, to put their loved ones to rest. So it's, um, you're, you're always hopeful that we don't find those situations, um, but it's, it's, devastating as a country to have um, had that happen. And I think the outpour of, co of concern and love uh, was incredible. And I do remember the question I had before that, which was, um, what are your thoughts on having uh, 10 paid sick days instead of five? I, um, Certainly, uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry has indicated that if you're sick, you should not be going to work. And we know that um, we have a number of employees whose employer uh, uh, is a small business and can't afford uh, to pay 10 days sick pay. So it very much depends on um, where, where do we find that money and, um, and how do we make sure that it, it's, um, it's addressing the need. Because I, I think that the 10 day sick pay is in response to um, COVID incubation period. And so um, we need as governments to figure out how do we pay that um, rather than putting one more thing on the back of, of employers um, who are struggling right now. So um, it's a health issue. And it's up to government to find the the um, the answer to that. But I'm absolutely adamant that we should not be putting one more burden on small business or small employers. 
Um, so you and I have talked at great length uh, about healthcare in our area. Um, and one of the things, again, that John Morgan talked about on the 27th was the primary care network uh, and how they're hoping to expand that into um, the interior and that sort of thing. Can you go into a little bit more detail about how that's working or not working? I don't have any information on that at this time, uh, Gareth, but I'll I'll uh, see what I can find for our for our next interview. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Um, what else has been going on? So what have you, since uh, COVID started, what have you really been up to? Have you been home mostly or have you um, done any kind of meetings or have you traveled at all to any parts of uh, your riding or have you pretty much just stayed home? Absolutely following uh, Dr. Henry's um, advice. She's asked us to stay home, so I've stayed home. Okay. Um, she's asked us to minimize the number of people that are in our bubble, and I've done that. I can tell you when you live alone, isolation is a whole new uh, experience. And I have a real empathy for uh, seniors and others who live alone during this time. Because, you know, when you're busy in the daytime and you're out and about doing the work like I do, um, going from community to community, and you come home at night, um, it's nice to come home to uh, sometimes a quiet house. But a quiet house 24-7 um, is pretty darn quiet. So, um, so I've, I've got a new empathy and uh, certainly would encourage anybody who knows someone who's living alone to reach out and actually give them a phone call. Um, those kinds of things are often the lifeline of a day. You know, oh, someone phoned me today. Um, but I've been at home doing a lot of Zoom meetings, lots of um, interaction with um, different groups uh, via Zoom. Um, I, I can tell you sitting in front of a computer is not the same as meeting people in person. That is my preference but that's not available to us right now. So um, the challenge uh, of working from home is when you've got your dining room table as your workspace, it's uh, sometimes tough to step away from it because um, the work is endless. Um, the people who are concerned, who are afraid, who, um, who are facing challenges that they've never faced before, um, we, we receive all those phone calls. And so our our goal is to make sure we get back to them in a timely way. And uh, so it's been it's been lots of work from home and um, and I'm looking forward to going back to the legislature on the 22nd of June. Um, so right now there's been a, a big drop in the amount of gas that's being used. Do you think that this might be a good time to push some more green initiatives? I think that anything that will help the economy, uh, it's a good time to look at anything that will help the economy. And certainly when we look at any new initiatives, uh, green initiatives are a top priority. Um, we only have to look at some of the um, satellite images of the difference in air quality um, when we shut communities down. And I have to say, you know, when, when, I, um, when we first started uh, the COVID process and they showed pictures of China and of Wuhan, um, it was almost surreal. I couldn't believe that something could shut down um, a community of more than a million, many million people. And, um, but that, that isn't sustainable. And so how do we, as we look at our new world, how do we ensure as we open up and um, look at our new normal, uh, how do we ensure that we minimize impact on the environment, the air, the water, and um, and rethink perhaps what we've done in the past. Cool. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? Well, I'd just like to say that um, as you know, it's 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 been challenging uh, as an MLA 
um, during COVID because um, 90 percent of my work is being out in community. It's meeting with groups, it's uh, meeting with um, different uh, concerned constituents in their communities, at their homes, uh, in their businesses. And so this has been a very, very uh, different kind of two months. But um, we're here to help people. And don't ever hesitate to email or phone us. Our office uh, is opening again on June 1st. We will have all the public health officers um, uh, criteria in place, um, but we know how important it is for the public to have access to us. Uh, we're, for anybody who deals with our office, you'll know that an email uh, will get answered 24 seven usually. And um, we do our best to make sure we get back to you. I wanna say to people who are concerned about the, the speed in which we open up um, our communities again. Um, there's two sides to this balance. And one side is the health side, which I think Dr. Henry has under control and has done a superb job at. The challenge now is for government to uh, put together a very clear and comprehensive reopening plan so that people know when they can expect to go back to work, when they can expect um, things to open um, and plan their life around that. Um, we're going into the summer. The expectation is that uh, COVID may, um, may be uh, on, a, on a downswing for a while, but um, they also expect it to come back in the fall along with the normal flus that come along. So how do we prepare ourselves for what that might look like? So um, I would suggest to you when we're talking about what our future looks like, we're not talking about going back. Right. We're talking about envisioning something new, um, something that uh, reflects what we've learned during COVID. And, um, and I believe something perhaps much more family oriented and much, uh, much different than we were before. So um, everybody has a comfort level for themselves. As I've said to many who have phoned me and said, you know, we shouldn't let strangers in our community. Um, we all have personal choices. Bonnie Henry has told us we can stay at home, we can isolate ourselves, and um, we can go out when we feel comfortable. And so it's up to you to decide what your comfort level is and, um, and when you start um, expanding your bubble. So um, please, um, please support local. Uh, please remember that people are unemployed. Please remember that we have many in our community who don't know where their rent and food money is gonna come from. So, uh, and we have a great many seniors who, um, who have been extremely affected um, by the isolation and by the vulnerability of that segment of our population. And our seniors are much more than numbers, they're people. And so reach out and uh, make someone's day to day, give them a phone call. Um, and I have one hypothetical question for you. And then uh, I think that that's uh, good. We're, we've almost been talking for an hour already. It went okay. by. Really fast. Um, but um, if things reopen here in the next couple of weeks and you have the option to travel to somewhere in British Columbia, where would that be? You know, every place in British Columbia is beautiful. And, um, you know, you think, I could just throw a dart at a map and I would be happy to go there. But I think a visit to family first. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for uh, everyone else that watched uh, this video that we've been chatting with Jackie Taggart, our local MLA for Fraser Nicola. 
Um, and thank you for taking the time to do this with us today. And we look forward to doing another one in the near future. Thank you, Gareth.